Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Timothy Harrison, and I serve as the principal deputy director of the HHS Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy, or OIDP. I would like to welcome you all to today's webinar uh, discussing the recent release of the National HIV AIDS Strategies Federal Implementation Plan. While we work together to continue to respond to the challenges presented by COVID-19 and monkeypox, it is also critical to continue our efforts to end the HIV epidemic, as well as address the concurrent epidemics of viral hepatitis, sexually transmitted infections, and substance use disorders. The Department of Health and Human Services and the OIDP team have enjoyed supporting the White House in developing the National HIV AIDS Strategies Federal Implementation Plan. The implementation plan was released in August and details over 380 actions that agencies from across the federal department, the federal government will take individually and collaboratively to implement the National HIV AIDS Strategy. These actions reflect federal agencies' commitments to programs, policies, research, and other activities needed to meet the strategy's goals and bolster our efforts to end the HIV epidemic. The implementation plan also introduces some new indicators of progress. And importantly for all of our viewers today, issues a call to action to all non-federal stakeholders from across the nation. To share more information about all of this with you, I'm pleased to have joining me here today, Harold Phillips, Director of the White House Office of National AIDS Policy, Quality of Life Indicator Workgroup Co-Chairs, Kate Bukach, Norma Harris, and Marlene Matoski, and Ronald Johnson, Chair of the U.S. People Living with HIV Caucus. I look forward to hearing from them on the work that went into this federal implementation plan, as well as hearing a community perspective on the federal implementation plan and the new quality of life indicators. I'm very encouraged by the scope and content of the National HIV Strategy and its federal implementation plan, and by the participation of so many federal departments and agencies in their development. OIDP looks forward to ongoing collaboration with the White House Office of National AIDS Policy and our federal partners to implement the strategy, and as well as working with many of you. With the leadership and support of the White House, I know we will continue to push for innovation and identify new ways to work together and support communities across the nation to achieve our national goal of ending the HIV epidemic. With that, I will hand it over to Director Phillips. Thank you, Dr. Harrison, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, we are very excited about the National Federal Implementation Plan. Um, and uh, thank you all for joining us today while we talk about the plan itself as well as give you some recent updates on some of the activities that have been uh, undertaken by many of the federal partners that move us beyond just planning, but also implementation. Um, the quality of life indicator update, which I'm um, very excited and pleased to have the co-chairs of the federal work group on that, uh, who will also provide some comments. And then sort of call to action, where do we go from here are all part of, uh, part of my section of this webinar. So let's go to the next slide, please. Um, and I'll talk a little bit just uh, in case uh, some had forgotten about the National HIV AIDS Strategy, which is our overall framework for, for this work and sort of a roadmap for how we hope to move toward an end of the HIV epidemic by the year 2030. Next slide. President Biden released the strategy on World AIDS Day of 2021. Uh, and in that strategy, he called for us to accelerate our efforts. Um, the strategy itself, uh, which was updated, um, also called for us to develop uh, a federal implementation plan that would include the actions and activities taken by our federal partners. I think it's also important to note that um, the national strategy is a national strategy 
calling on all sectors of American society to help us in this effort to end the HIV epidemic. The federal implementation plan that we're gonna talk about are, je are just representative of some of the transformative actions that the, plan that the federal government is planning to take. But as part of this overall effort to end the HIV epidemic, we're gonna call upon our private sector partners, um, community organizations, faith-based organizations, the academic sector and the philanthropic sector to all help us in this effort. This, the INHAS or the National HIV AIDS Strategy is that framework and roadmap, which hopefully gets us to, to take those steps. Next slide. The strategy itself has the overall vision for HIV in the United States. Uh, it has four goals, which are supported by 21 objectives and 78 strategies. Uh, all those strategies and objectives are designed in a way to help us move forward on the goals themselves, which we will talk about those as well. Eight priority populations that are identified based on our national surveillance data uh, to identify those populations at greatest need in the United States and also the indicators of our progress, which we will spend a lot more time talking about, but there are the core indicators as well as the disparity reduction indicators. And we're also gonna spend uh, time on this webinar talking about the quality of life indicators uh, and the process for the development of those as well. Next slide. Here on the screen are the four goals. Again, very measurable and achievable goals. Uh, for our nation uh, and how, again, the strategies, the objectives are all related to those goals and the indicators will help us measure our progress in meeting those goals over the life of the strategy itself. Next slide. So again, uh, all of these are intended to guide our actions by both federal and our non-federal stakeholders. Next slide. As we talk about the implementation plan, it's important to note a couple of things. Um, and the implementation plan, next slide, includes the action steps that specific agencies will perform in implementing those strategies to help us achieve the goals. These action steps, so the national strategy is sort of the, the what, the action steps are how we're trying to, how to get and achieve sort of the overall what. The action steps themselves, as you will see, next slide, are comprised of actions that will be taken by 10 federal departments to implement the national HIV AIDS strategy. It has more than 380 action items that span the programs, policies, research, and other activities and involve multiple agencies within those 10 departments. Now, some things to keep in mind. While there are greater than 380 action items, there are more things that the federal government is doing, but these 380 represent some of the things that we feel are transformative in helping to meet these goals. Of the 380 actions, I think it's important to note that at least 20 of them that are specifically identified with sort of having a focus on aging. That doesn't mean that there aren't other things that they will be doing that will help the population of people in the United States that are aging with HIV. But there are at least 20 that are identifiable in this plan that speak to those issues. Same thing when it comes to the syndemic, when, which we've talked a lot about, both STI, viral hepatitis, and HIV. There are 26 identifiable actions that touch on the syndemic. There are another 44 actions within this uh, implementation plan that touch on workforce and identified uh, by the Office of National Drug Control Policy, and they were thrilled about this, that there are at least 55 actions that touch on substance use disorder in some form or behavioral health. So again, while these are not the, the width and the breadth of everything that the federal government will do, these are actions that we have identified that will be transformative in helping us meet our goals. But each of the federal agencies and the programs are doing 
much more when it comes to the work of trying to move us forward and in, in achieving the goals of the strategy. Next slide, quality of life indicators. Next slide, let's talk about that because we committed within our national HIV AIDS strategy to develop new indicators on quality of life for people living with HIV. And this is in response to things that we have heard from the community um, over the last couple of years about really thinking more comprehensively and holistically about the lives of people living with HIV. Namely and specifically, the people living with HIV are much more than just clinical lab values. And there are aspects of their life that we need to think about more comprehensively and holistically that are outside of sort of those lab values when we think about sort of their lives as a whole. So what we did was task a federal work group of subject matter experts, uh, the chairs of that work group, you'll hear from later on this call, to listen to community input, identify some options for possible measures and data sources and targets. One of the things that I did not want us to do or get caught in is this whole process of having to identify new data, data collection methodologies, then sort of have to figure out how we're gonna fund that and support it both at the state and local level and at the federal level, then also get it all approved by the Office of Management Budget in order to be able to ask all of these questions. But the best way to sort of jumpstart this process rather than spend another five years trying to get new indicators sort of cleared through the system was to figure out what data we're currently collecting at a national level that could be used for this, especially in light of what we're hearing about quality of life in its domain. I tasked them with looking at coming up with one indicator for quality of life. And what the work group said, based on both what they heard and what was available, is that no one single indicator was really going to do justice to the multiple dimensions of quality of life. What they proposed is a set of five new indicators that will now be part of the NHAS and also part of the federal implementation plan that we will use to measure quality of life for people living with HIV in the United States. Next slide. When you hear, so let me go back, if you could, can I go back, just one? One, one thing that I wanna say before I turn this over to our uh, other partners, uh, to our federal uh, partners on this is that, uh, in, in looking at those five new indicators, and they're gonna walk through sort of what they did and what how they how we got here. Um, I think this is where the real work is going to occur when it comes to implementing the strategy. Is that now in the United States, and 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 there is this is a, a pivotal moment for us in sort of talking about differently how we value and look at the lives of people living with HIV and think about quality of life. And what you're gonna hear about these indicators is definitely going to call for us to think about system and stru structural, systemic structural barriers, social determinants of health in a very different way. It's also gonna charge our programs with thinking about what else they can do both administratively and policy-wise to impact these indicators. It's also gonna call for all of us to think creatively about new partnerships and collaborations to help address some of these issues that are in, involved and intertwined in quality of life as well. And I think as a nation, for us to say that this is important, and it's important enough for us to hold ourselves accountable and to look to measure it in the future, it is a hallmark moment in how we look at and think about HIV in the United States of America. And I don't say that lightly. Um, and a lot of incredible work, I think, both from the community as well as federal partners to help move us forward in this direction um, needs to be acknowledged and lifted up as we think about what this means moving forward in our next decade of, of addressing HIV. Next slide. So again, uh, next slide. So what I've said is in order to do this and to do this well, it can't just be the federal government. It's got to be an all of society response to this, both for the national HIV AIDS strategy, which calls for us to have a more coordinated and re-energized national response. 
And so I'm hoping that the implementation plan, which outlines what the federal government is planning to do, or at least some of the major steps, it will also highlight some areas where we might need, where we need the additional assistance and input and help from other sectors of society. Next slide. A few other things that I wanna to call to your attention because not only have we been developing the uh, implementation plan, but many of the federal agencies are also been moving into that space of implementing and, and taking on certain activities as well. Next slide. So uh, again, you will see that within sort of the national HIV AIDS strategy and the implementation plan, sort of a coordinated response across agencies and working with uh, our partners, especially in HHS, on the STI plan, the viral hepatitis plan, and making sure that we're in alignment. Also, the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy has released not only a drug policy strategy, but also uh, a crystal meth strategy, which is also impacting uh, our communities. And so we've had the opportunity to work with them on those pieces as well, and really complicate, complement each other in the work and coordinate. Also, EHE continues to be an important call, core element of the work that we do to implement the National HIV AIDS strategy. Next slide. U equals U. Uh, this summer, hopefully you all have seen the announcement. We have aligned a lot of our um, language and usage of U equals U and also reaffirmed our commitment and using U equals U as a tool to help individuals both learn their HIV status, so increase access to HIV testing, but also access to antiretroviral treatment as part of our treatment as prevention uh, work in the United States. So there not being a conflict between some of what you were hearing earlier in the year about sort of the need to increase PrEP and work with those who are HIV negative, we can do multiple things at the same time when we put our minds to it as a federal government and work both to address the needs of people living with HIV while addressing and looking at the needs for those who are at risk for HIV and working across the HIV prevention care and treatment continuum. Next slide. The I'm, as, all, as part of this, the I Am a Work of Art campaign, which was out, rolled out by our partners at HHS uh, in the Office of Infectious Disease Policy. Many of these materials are available on hiv.gov. Um, really worked uh, really in a creative manner, both with not only the artist and designer, but also the creative partners from the community who were people living with HIV, nine individuals who told their stories about what it means to them to be on antiretroviral treatment and the things that they had been able to achieve in their lives. So hopefully reducing both the stigma and discrimination, but also encouraging others who are not in care and treatment to get on care and treatment and understanding how transformative it can be. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to look at it, please go to hiv.gov. There are materials there. There's also um, the video presentation and um, the nine individuals from across the country were extraordinary and it was great to, to spend time with them and, and hear their stories. Uh, so I encourage you all to do that if you haven't had a chance to do it. Next slide. We also had a meeting on uh, HIV criminalization in the White House uh, at the end of May, working with prosecutors to uh, get them to understand the science and medicine of HIV, as well as what was happening in some of their states by presenting them with data and having an opportunity within a safe space to talk with public health officials. For many of them, it was the first time they met their state AIDS director. Um, and so also, um, it had a little bit of a spillover effect in that um, it helped them understand and be more aware of uh, the fact that they should be asking more questions. They should be considering these laws. They should be considering um, um, in very often in some of these cases, lack of criminal intent and lack of HIV transmission. And in some cases, not even sex occurs. So there can't be any HIV transmission. So um, I think it was a very transformative meeting. We are figuring out where we go, what we do next, but it's another tool, I think, in our toolbox of how we address some of these criminalization laws. Many of you, who, some of you who are on this call, I suspect have been involved in efforts 
to change and reform laws at the state level. That work should absolutely continue. continue. Uh, but also I think the federal government, now we have a new framework for how we can work with prosecutors on some of these things, even in places where the law isn't changing, prosecutors have a lot of authority and can use their guidelines in different ways. So again, I think coming at this problem and issue in two different directions may help us get the results we need. Next slide. Also, um, congratulations to our colleagues in the Ryan White program, uh, very successful Ryan White conference almost three weeks ago. Um, with an incredible number of uh, participants virtually. I think I heard a number somewhere like 9,000 individuals over the course of the days of that conference participated. So kudos to you all. I remember when it was very small and it was like 500 people. So this is totally incredible. But in addition to that, they've also done some new work, um, new awards have come out through the Ryan White program uh, for the Special Projects of National Significance and also using the MAFE projects, which will continue to move the ball in innovative ways, um, both uh, in looking at improving outcomes for people aging with HIV, telehealth, looking at housing interventions and their replication and scale up, and then uptake of long-acting injectables, ART, uh, for people living with HIV. Next slide. Also, wanted to let you know there's also been new funding that's come out from CDC, IHS, and SAMHSA and some of the, their funded projects that, again, are all in line with the strategy. And these are all different ways that the agencies are moving rapidly into um, that implementation phase and also trying to accelerate uh, the things we know we need to accelerate um, nationwide. Next slide. We've also done some work. So there is the work that we do in the administration, or at least my office does, try to advocate for additional and new funding for HIV. And then there's this piece of trying to ensure that we're using the funds that we do have allocated efficiently and effectively. Many of our federal agencies are all involved in implementation science, really looking at what is the evidence base uh, effective interventions and best practices that need to be put forward. And so a lot of that work around best practices com compilations is all out there from CDC, HRSA, NIH, SAMHSA, and also NIH coordinated across the HHS, uh, the American Journal of Public Health um, special edition that looks at addressing intersectional stigma and discrimination uh, to improve HIV related health outcomes. This piece, uh, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, please take a look at it, includes um, not only uh, work from the federal level, but also work that's been happening at the community level as well. There was also the Jade's article as well when it comes to sort of looking at what we've been doing with EHE and again, looking at effective interventions. So some dissemination of findings and best practices and putting all those out there. Next slide. I think this is probably it for me. Uh, and now I am very happy to turn it over to Norma Harris, Kate and Marlene, uh, CDC and HRSA, who've led our quality of life indicators work group. Thank you, Harold, and good afternoon uh, to everyone. I'm really pleased that you all could join us today. My name is Marlene Matoski, and I work at the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA uh, for short. Today's section on quality of life will provide details on the development and identification of the indicators for quality of life among persons with HIV, which are now new indicators, as Harold said, in the national strategy. I also want to take the opportunity to introduce you to Norma Harris and Kate Buhach. They're both of uh, uh, great colleagues, and they're from the CDC, and we uh, together co-led the work on this. Next slide, please. So in February of 2022, the, off, the White House Office of the National AIDS Policy, or ONAP for short, convened <clears throat> an NHAAS Quality of Life Indicator Federal in, Interagency Workgroup. The participating agencies, you can see them all here on their screen, and their members are listed as well. I'd like to acknowledge all of our colleagues from across the different departments who participated, their commitment, their long hours, and their thoughtful, active engagement for several months that led us to this suite of quality of life indicators 
that were recommended and accepted by ONAP. And again, I want to acknowledge Kate and Norma um, as my fellow co-chairs. Next slide, please. So we had a rather large charge that Harold laid out for us, um, uh, and it's all listed out here on the screen. And these were the guidance that we had to use to develop the indicators. So first we were to develop NHAS indicators on quality of life for people with HIV using existing data sources. So we had to consider the various approaches as well as available data options and select the best source or sources. We then also engaged uh, members of the HIV community in developing these quality of life indicators. We ensured there was connection between the indicators and the ability of our agencies to help to uh, move those quality of life indicators in the right direction. And this included engaging in discussions with the full National HIV AIDS Strategy Federal Implementation Workgroup so they can consider their agency actions as they implement the National HIV AIDS Strategy. Lastly, uh, we recommended to the Office of the National AIDS Policy and the Federal Implementation Workgroup other aspects or dimensions of quality of life that could be addressed through other federal actions action items and our complementary data sources. And then lastly, we were also asked to be parsimonious in our approach of identifying all these measures. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Norma. Thank you, Kate. So the work group used and reviewed the NHOS criteria for the quality of life related indicators. And this criteria was adapted from NHOS uh, publication uh, updated to 2020. It was slightly adapted for use, and the slight adaptation was to include criterion G, which is to reflect one or more quality of life domains, which is really important addition for the work that we uh, undertook. The criteria really guided the work of the group's discussions, and one of the criteria that I'd like to highlight here was that data source that was used for in-house indicators should be nationally representative, so that's criterion E, and preferably have data available by state. So you'll, we'll come back to this later on in the presentation, but that was one of the highlighted uh, criteria. Next slide. So in terms of the process that the federal interagency work group undertook, um, it included multiple steps. We reviewed and inventoried common quality of life related measures and existing large databases containing these measures in the US, including those uh, that included uh, data on persons with HIV. We presented at a community meeting convened by ONAP. We discussed potential candidate measures and data sources. Again, we reviewed the NHOS criteria. We identified several options and categorized these options based on a time frame. So we had an immediate option, an intermediate option, and a long-term option. Um, based on our conversations with um, Harold, the director of the National AIDS Policy, um, it was emphasized to us that we need to focus on the immediate option which is to identify data sources, data source or sources and indicators by June of 2022. Next slide. In addition to the NHOS criteria, other considerations um, included determining whether to focus on health related quality of life or a broader quality of life concept that includes social determinants of health discussing advantages and disadvantages of selecting single item constructs versus using multi-item scale to measure components of quality of life, reviewing baseline data to determine if there is enough um, uh, data that would, we would be able to see changes in performance. In other words, are the baseline data nearing a goal already or is there room for improvement? outlining potential activities and or interventions that agencies and their grantees or recipients could uh, implement that might result in positive change in the indicators, addressing community concerns, and anticipating unintended negative consequences that could occur as a result of choosing an indicator. And then back to the idea of parsimony, we were 
um, charged with selecting a few indicators, again, being parsimonious um, in the number that were selected. So next slide. So as you've heard before, the ODAP charge to the work group was to use an existing data source for the indicator or indicators. In addition, I've highlighted the indicator criterion, uh, criteria that have guided the work group's discussions. In particular, I've highlighted one criteria that talked about using a data source that can produce nationally representative data, also preferably able to produce or provide data by state. The Medical Monitoring Project, or MMP, meets the aforementioned criteria. MMP is a national HIV surveillance system that collects annual cross-sectional data to produce nationally representative estimates of socio-demographic, behavioral, and clinical factors among adults diagnosed with HIV in the United States. In addition to national estimates, MMP produces local estimates for the 23 MMP project areas which include approximately 70% of adults with diagnosed HIV in the United States. The data are collected using a two-stage complex sample survey methodology in which the first stage selected 16 US states in Puerto Rico, and the second stage selected annual samples of adults with HIV within each jurisdiction. Please also note that MMP was already a data source for two NHOS indicators, HIV stigma and homelessness. And in the following slides, Kate will talk about the selected quality of life indicators and the definitions. Kate. Good afternoon. Thank you, Norma. So um, the work group recommended the following five measures from MMP, which have been incorporated into NHAS as quality of life indicators. For the physical domain, self-rated health. For the mental emotional domain, and met need for services from a mental health professional. And for structural subsistence domain, food insecurity, unemployment, and unstable housing or homelessness. Please note that the last measure replaces the previous NHAS indicator that only captured homelessness. Next, I will explain each of the measures in detail. Next slide, please. And next. In the physical domain, we recommended self-rated health, which is defined as rating one's health as good, very good, or excellent, as opposed to poor or fair at the time of MMP interview. The denominator for this measure is all US adults with diagnosed HIV. Next. In the mental emotional domain, we recommended unmet need for services from a mental health professional, which is defined as needing but not receiving services from a mental health professional during the past 12 months. The denominator for this measure is US adults with diagnosed HIV who indicated needing mental health services, that is either receiving or needing but not receiving such services. Put another way, this measure captures unmet need for mental health services among those with any need, either met or unmet. Next, please. In the structural subsistence domain, we recommended food insecurity which is defined as being hungry and not eating because there wasn't enough money for food in the past 12 months. The denominator for this measure is all US adults with diagnosed HIV. Next, please. Also in the structural subsistence domain, we recommended unemployment, which is defined as being unemployed at the time of interview. The denominator for this measure is all US adults with diagnosed HIV. Next. And also in the structural subsistence domain, we recommended unstably housed or homeless, which is defined as being unstably housed or homeless during the past 12 months. Unstably housed is defined as being evicted, moving two or more times, or moving in with others because of financial problems. Homelessness is defined as living on the street, in a shelter, a single room occupancy hotel, or a car. The denominator for this measure is all US adults with diagnosed HIV. And please note all measures are self-reported by the person with HIV during the MMP interview. Next slide, please. The work group also recommended goals for each indicator, which have been incorporated into NHAS. We use the same methodology for setting quality of life indicator targets 
as that which was used to set prior and has 2022 to 2025 indicator targets. So for self-rated health, the goal is to increase self-rated health to 95% from a 2018 baseline of 71.5%. For unmet need for services from a mental health professional, the goal is to reduce unmet need by 50% from a 2017 baseline of 24.2%. For food insecurity, the goal is to reduce food insecurity by 50% from a 2017 baseline of 21.1%. For unemployment, the goal is to reduce unemployment by 50% from a 2017 baseline of 14.9%. And for unstable housing or homelessness, the goal is to reduce unstable housing or homelessness by 50% from a 2018 baseline of 21.0%. And please note that the reason for differences in baseline year is due to changes in the MMP questionnaire that resulted in some measures being added later than others. Next slide. So in summary, quality of life is a multidimensional concept related to whole person health and well-being. ONAP solicited community input, and the work group heard community desires to consider lived experiences that influence quality of life. These include social determinants of health, such as unemployment, food insecurity, and housing instability. We also heard a sentiment to not solely focus on health-related quality of life. And thus, ultimately, the work group identified, and in June of 2022, recommended to ONAP a total of five indicators spanning three different quality of life dimensions. And please find at the bottom of the slide a reference to uh, tables that were published uh, summarizing the baseline data from MMP that informed our uh, target setting. I thank you for your attention. I guess I'll, I'll chime in. Uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity to give the next portion of our webinar today. Uh, my name is Ronald Johnson. I chair the US People Living with HIV Caucus. And I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, again, participate in this webinar to give a community perspective on HIV, uh, the implementation plan of NAS and the quality of life indicators. Next slide. When we talk about community, uh, that's certainly a very broad term. So I wanna start off by defining the community uh, that I am representing and uh, giving the perspective of. Uh, the US, I, I said I chair the US People Living with HIV Caucus. Uh, the caucus is comprised of organizations. It's really a, a network of networks of, of people living with HIV, networks that represent people living with HIV, and striving to, to make sure that the principles of self-empowerment and self-determination are ingrained in all aspects of the HIV response. Uh, next slide. We are, as I said, made up of uh, networks and organizations and individual advocates of who are living with HIV. The caucus is anchored by seven of the largest networks of people living and living with HIV and collectively represent those populations most impacted by HIV throughout the country and giving a voice, we strive to give a voice to those communities, those people most impacted by HIV. Next slide. And about a year ago, uh, in July of 2021, the caucus released its federal policy agenda demanding better uh, a federal policy agenda. And just as Harold pointed out that the National HIV AIDS Strategy was a framework, a roadmap, demanding better was is a, a roadmap to uh, how the federal 
response to, uh, to HIV uh, needs to be improved, needs to be expanded, uh, needs to be better. That's why we were demanding better. <clears throat> Next slide. Some of the issues uh, that were identified in the uh, demanding better uh, agenda, the meaningful involvement of people living with HIV, creating a human rights environment for people living with HIV, and the quality of life for people living with HIV, and, and stressing those factors that impact uh, and lead to a, a good quality of life, and recognizing that the biomedical markers, as important as they are, and certainly those of us living with HIV are alive because of the advancements in biomedicine and, and treatments, but that's not the end game. It, the end game is our total quality of life, and that was uh, so very important as we work together to uh, implement and the the strategy and as we are looking at the response and our perspective next slide to the the strategy and in the implementation plan overall uh I, our view uh, uh, is that the the framework uh of the national hiv aids strategy and the federal implementation plan provide a framework in which we can develop the policies and programs that are needed, not only to end the ep HIV epidemic, but moving towards the vision of NAS, that is a vision in which people living with HIV are healthy and living a lives of and thriving and dignity. And, and that is why we feel that if this is a, a good framework, but a framework is the beginning. It's not the completed product and much more work needs to be done. And I hope the comments that we make today and going forward will get us moving on the far much more work that still needs to be done. Next. Next slide. Some of the strengths that we see in the federal implementation plan, and we've heard about the quality of the new quality of life indicators, and I will return and say a little bit more about that. But the federal implementation plan has a whole of government approach, which we think is very, very important. The fact that so many federal departments contributed to uh, the implementation plan, looked at how their agencies need to be involved in the national HIV strategy and developing a plan of action for that. The federal implementation plan does as reflective of the national HIV AIDS strategy itself, elevating some of the structural and social determinants of, of health and, and the importance of that and how those determinants must be addressed as we end the epidemic and as we further ensure that the lives of people living with HIV are, are met and the health needs and the wellness needs are, are met integrating racial equity throughout the, the, the NAS and the implementation plan uh, is a really another strength that we would identify. And identify in the inclusion of gender affirming care and harm reduction services, such as safe syringe uh, programs. Next slide. Again, looking at the, the quality of life indicators, and I think this is a, a notable uh, advancement uh, forward in indicating the, the multi-dimensional quality and uh, the work group members that just reported noted that multi-dimensional quality of, of life that we can't use one measure uh, of to to get at the quality of life. We need many domains, many measurements, and the five indicators that 
were identified in the uh, federal implementation plan and the work of the, the task force is very commendable, I think, in identifying those, those measurements, the, the multiplicity of issues that make up quality of, of life. But looking at that, we have to remember that measuring quality of life is not the same thing as improving the quality of life. And that's where the rest of the implementation plan, and as we look at that plan, we need to see how does this get us forward to improving the quality of life of people living with HIV and improving the conditions of people affected by HIV as the national strategy itself calls for us doing. Next slide. So I think it's very important that we highlight uh, and point out some of the very real gaps in the federal implementation plan and identifying those gaps and realizing that the, the strategy and the plan are frameworks. Uh, it's important to see the work that needs to go forward in building on that framework we recognize some of the, the gaps. Uh, there needs to be more in getting clearer commitment to meaningfully involving uh, people living with HIV, other stakeholders in the, the community, but meaningfully involving people living with HIV really does need to be strengthened throughout the federal implementation plan and in making community engagement real. Need to address actions to improve the healthcare and to support people aging with HIV and long-term survivors. This is so critically important to the success of not only the, the national strategy, but the federal implementation plan also. People living with HIV already who are 50 years and older, already make up over half of all people living with HIV. That number and the percentage is going to be increasing and in the years ahead, ahead. The actions that actually make a difference in the healthcare of older adults and long-term survivors needs a far more central point in the federal implementation plan uh, going forward to fulfill the the goals of the national HIV AIDS strategy uh, and that particular objective of, of whole person care. So I really want to highlight uh, the shortcomings in terms of the focus on older adults living with HIV and long-term survivors. Uh, we need more robust actions to end HIV criminalization. So I want to highlight that the, the strategy itself calls for promoting laws and promoting states to move towards ending criminalization of, of HIV. The actions that have been identified in the plan fall short of that and we need more work to make sure that the federal government is fully engaged in doing its part in promoting the states to do action. The action has to be done at the state level, but the federal government has an important role to play. Uh, there is much to be talked about in terms of molecular HIV surveillance and the role that it plays in ending the epidemic uh, needs also further attention to the, the data privacy, the human rights issues, and that we need to put a halt on molecular HIV and surveillance until those human rights issues are nationwide addressed. Fully integrating sexual and reproductive health is very important. Next slide. I know we want to get to the questions and answers, so I'm going to move a little bit quickly. Uh, taking concrete actions, uh, as I said, the measuring quality of life is very, very crucial 
but it is not the same as improving the quality of life. There are many opportunities uh, that we need to uh, move forward. Next slide. I wanna give two quick examples of where we think change is, is, is necessary and needed. Uh, the employment area is one uh, point of uh, change where I wanna highlight where there's a lot of opportunity for further work. I wanna acknowledge all of the work that has been put into developing the, uh, the implementation plan and an inclusion of employment that is so very, very important. And the fact that employment is part of the measurement of quality of life, there needs to be more action in that. Next slide. And as I said, uh, the aging and HIV issues need far more specificity uh, and we need real change. The healthcare system for people living with HIV who are 50, 60, 70 years of age is failing. Uh, we People, in various listening session, sessions, older adults themselves have said, we need new models of care that take into consideration the comorbidities and assessments that are necessary uh, to in integrate geriatric care and HIV care. There is much more work that needs to be done in this area. And I think this is an example of other areas in which the federal implementation plan, again, is a framework, but needs more work to identify the specific outcomes that are going to be necessary to achieve what is already written in the implementation plan of having significant difference in the populations, immediate and significant differences in the populations that bear the greatest burden of of HIV, the HIV and caring uh, aging actions that need to be strengthened are an example of where this plan needs to go further. Next slide. So some of the next steps and are uh, building on and uh, uh, ensuring accountability hosting meetings with the caucus and its members, other stakeholders, the partnership, and Harold talked about the partnership that is so crucial in going forward and identifying the changes that need to be made. I used an example of the employment and the services for older adults living with HIV as an example of the changes that need to be made, making sure that the meaningful engagement of people living with HIV uh, is, is ensured looking at PACHA and the charters of those groups and how they can be reconfigured to ensure designated representatives of the caucus is one example of the kind of movement and the next steps. Human rights, as I said, an example of that, ending the molecular HIV surveillance activities that symbolize the fact that human rights are not being respected uniformly and going forward, we need to do that. I'm out of time. I hope there's a time for questions. Uh, I wanna commend the Harold Phillips and all of the federal partners for their work in developing a framework and encourage them to go further. The aspirations of the, the national HIV AIDS strategy needs to be reflected in the implementation plans I feel that working together, we can achieve that. And I'm hoping that these next steps going forward, we will work together to achieve the changes that are necessary. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ron. As always, some wonderful insights. We really do appreciate your perspective. Um, and we now are gonna open up for questions that we received during uh, during the, the tenure of this webinar. Uh, first, I want to start off by saying that the slide deck for this webinar will be available uh, through uh, hiv.gov blog post tomorrow. So please, please look for that. Um, starting out uh, for Director Phillips. Um, so how does the federal implementation plan 
uh, speak to the clinical care needs of persons with HIV who are aging and, or elderly. So thanks for that question, Tim. And I know that there's been a lot of, of concern about um, the implementation plan and the strategy when it comes to those that are aging with HIV. And, and it's a concern that I think um, we are all very uh, aware of in the federal space. Um, I don't think that there is one of us that works in the federal government on HIV issues that is not aware of the fact that those with diagnosed HIV in the United States are over 50. The majority of those with diagnosed HIV are over 50. We are also aware in the United States of rising infection rates for those who are newly diagnosed uh, in this same cohort. So we are also pretty clear that in the United States, we're not, when we talk about care, access to care and treatment for HIV, we're not talking about babies in our country. So the fact that we have a national HIV AIDS plan strategy and an implementation plan that includes certain very specific elements about aging does not mean that we are not aware that our entire system is geared toward this population that is continuing to grow in, in numbers as well. We have over 20 specific agency actions <laughs> that are identified specifically for the aging population. But again, thinking more comprehensively about everything that we do, a lot of our work is around sort of expanding access within those clinics, addressing some of these things, not only in Ryan White, but also the VA system. So let's not, in, ignore them. There's also a research agenda, a clinical care, and a non-clinical aging services component. We also are very pleased that the Administration for Community Living has also included and identified the population of people living with HIV as a group that states must, in their plans, also include moving forward and think about services in a more comprehensive way. So our entire HIV service delivery system is tilting in the direction where we are focused on how to improve care and services and support for those who are aging. There's not one of us that is not aware of those issues and, and trying to make those changes, whether it be in research, whether it be in clinical care, whether it be in the support systems that are needed for those aging with HIV. So hopefully that, that helps address some of that. Um, and again, those actions that are identified in the implementation plan are not the only actions that, that we are undertaking. We hope to um, pull together, uh, I think using HIV.gov uh, in a way to sort of talk about some of the actions that we are taking, but also acknowledging that we are aware that HIV in the United States has shifted and changed and that and that we are fortunate to have individuals who are aging with HIV in the United States and that we need to change our, and that our systems are adapting and changing in ways to be able to address the, these groups. Wonderful. An another question for you, uh, Director Phillips. What can be done to amplify the voice of those with lived experience in the EHE efforts? So that's a really great question. Um, and, and it's one that I'm hoping that as we sort of have turned the COVID, turned the corner again on COVID, that we're able to sort of see more involvement and engagement of those with lived experiences. I think at the federal level, we have talked about it. We've put out guidance. We've also put out some best practices around ways to do it. I think some of this got, um, sort of uh, hampered by COVID, which March 2020, as we were rolling out EHE, you know, things sort of shut down. We all went to our sort of neutral corners and hopefully our safe spaces. Um, but I'm hoping that as things open back up, we will see more opportunities for gatherings and involvement and engagement of people with lived experience, which we all know is so important 
to be able to adequately address uh, and tailor services. Great, and I know we're at the hour. Just one last question here to wrap up. Are there any plans for the indicators to be reported prior to 2025 for an update report? Yes, there are uh, plans to report prior to 2025 on our progress within our plan. Our plan um, starts with the year 2022. So we're thinking that definitely by 2024, we will be able to provide some input, uh, some, some report that sort of looks at the data itself. But we're also thinking about this World AIDS Day being able to um, provide some sort of a progress update on some of the activities that we have engaged in since the implement, since the strategy was released on World AIDS Day of last year. What are some of the things that we have done to move the ball forward? I don't know, Norma, if there's more you want to add on sort of indicator reporting uh, timelines, but I didn't think dive into trying to do an indicator report by December of this year. Yeah, I guess the only thing that I would add to what you said, Harold, is that, you know, CDC will provide annual reports and then we'll be working hand in hand with the Office of National AIDS Policy as well as HHS by providing them data to be able to create progress reports that they want to um, create for the purposes of reporting on in-house. And at least that's been our experience in the past. And I have I'm thinking that will be the process moving forward. Great, thank you. And I wanna give a special thanks to all of our speakers today, Norma and Kate and Marlene and Ron, and of course, Director Phillips. We really do appreciate you taking the time and sharing all these particulars of the release of the Federal Implementation Plan. Again, please, you can access the Federal Implementation Plan, hiv.gov. And please look for a blog. This will have a connection a link to the slides. Thank you to everyone. Have a great day.